Good afternoon. Today we're at the Public Library of Cincinnati in Hamilton County in Cincinnati, Ohio. Today is March the 18th, 2010. We also have Dennis Daly on the camera and the interviewee today is Mr. Earl Hanson Wills. And we're also accompanied by Mr. Wills' wife, Mrs. Virginia Smith Wills and fortunate enough to have their daughter also, Mrs. Barbara Wills Grieber. Earl, let's get started with your interview about what was happening about the time that you were getting involved in uh, World War II. The country was, a lot of your friends were going into the service and things like that, and your home then was uh, in Pendleton? I lived in Pendleton County, and there was a lot of boys around who went into the service, and they were getting called into the draft board and I went to check into getting in the uh, Air Force and we didn't make it there, we had some problems. So I went back home and a week or two went by and I got a notice from the draft board and my dad took me down to the draft board office and asked them about me getting off on account of the farm, uh, living on a rather large farm. And the man says, well, I can get you off, I don't do. And he turned around and asked me, he says, what do you want to do? Oh. I says, it don't matter to me. I says, I just soon go as not. And he said, okay. Well, five days later, I got a notice to report for the service. So I was inducted over to Fort Thomas, left there, and went to Camp Wheeler in Georgia in the infantry. Okay. Finished my infantry training there and was shipped out to Aberdeen Brewing Grounds in Maryland and put on the military police force. Tell us what that Fort Wheeler was like, that initial training. You arrived there on a bus, I guess? We left Fort Thomas and got on a Pullman train and was dropped off in Macon, Georgia. And the first thing they did was shave your hair? Give you a haircut? Very possible. I don't remember all that. <laughs> I'm sure they did. They probably done that to you at Fort Thomas. Well, what was what was the basic training like? Do you remember anything like that? Do you get up at five in the morning, things like that? Yes, get up at five in the morning, stood out for reveille, and went and had breakfast, and then we had a schedule for the day. And if you wasn't shaved proper, you went back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that basic training was not much trouble. I asked to get into the ordinance part or the automotive part and they said there was not much hope or chance of it but uh, as time went by they was needing some drivers and they asked if anybody would like to take a driver's test for trucks. I said yeah I'll take a driver's test. We went down and reported and I think there was three or five, I don't remember now, just what people went down for driver's test. We had to take a driver's test on a two and a half ton truck, heavy duty job. Mm -hmm. I got in it, we pulled around there, and there's a concrete ramp. We went right straight up a steep bank there. He says, go up that concrete ramp. Huh. Went halfway up, and he says, stop. I did. Now he says, take off. I did. Went out and went to the top of it, and he says, you passed. <laughs> I said, well, what? He says, you did not let the truck ease back not one inch when you took off. So that was the test? That was the test. I had driven the truck beforehand, and I, I knew enough about how to do it. And you drove tractors, of course, on the farm. Well, not then. We didn't have a tractor then. We had one a long time ago, but I never did drive it. 
back when I was six or eight years old, we had a little fortune tractor. Dad drove for some. But I still couldn't get an automotive school down there. And then when we were shipped out, didn't know where it was going, but we went to Aberdeen and put me in the MPs there. And in that for a long time, and I've done town patrol and, and every kind of task that the MP's done there, done traffic and guard duty and town duty and, and everything. And I guess I was there for 17 months. Now, where would town duty be? Would that be Aberdeen? Maryland or Baltimore? We, we walked town duty in three different places. Having to Grace, Maryland, Elkton, Maryland, and, and uh, let's see another place. Uh, can you remember the name? Maybe Laurel. So, Laurel? Hmm? Laurel? By chance. No. Yeah. One of the small towns around. Yeah. Maryland. And of course, we had to do special duties in a lot of other places, but that was also after we was there for a long, like 17 months, they come around one day and said that, that they needed some men down in the ordinance. Does anybody want to volunteer? Oh. Go, go to the ordinance. And I said, yes. So that night, packed up my clothes, moved down into the ordinance barracks. The next day they come around and says, you're assigned to go to Harvard Grace, Maryland and be on detached service in the chemical warfare. So I we went down there. See, that's a separate camp from Aberdeen Brewers. I see. So I was down there for a while and worked in uh, research work on rockets mm -hmm. and stuff. and the head sergeant that was in charge of the detached service down there. Him and me got to be pretty good friends. I'd done a little work on his car one day down there. He had his car there. So he said, how would you like to be in charge of all the equipment? I said, sounds like a good deal to me. <laughs> right. So I got a driver's license to drive all the tanks, all the amphibian equipment and all the things we used down there. And all I had to do was make sure they filled with gas and send them in for service when they needed it or any minor thing that I could do. How many tanks or amphibious pieces of gear did they have down there? Dozens they, or hundreds? No, no, no. They just had one big amphibian truck and they had one amphibian tank and they had a weasel. Uh, and they had three or four armored tanks that they used for bomb shelters. For bomb shelters. And I had to run them out in the fields when they were firing rockets and stuff like that to, for a shelter. And so? They, they'd fire the rockets out there and they'd explode, you know, and they had to take pictures of it and everything. And they had them tanks. I'd drive the tank out there, and somebody would bring me back to the garage in a, in a Jeep. I didn't have to stay out there. So, personnel actually went to the tank to hide there, get in it? Yeah. Yeah, they had people out there with cameras. And they, when they, when they exploded, you see, and then they had their cameras set watching the explosion. And so that's where they first tested, tested these bazookas. Sounds kind of unsafe, testing all this. Well, there was a few tragedies. There were? Yeah. Tell us about those. Well, the one major one that I can remember is I drove a tank out there with a civilian and one of the boys, in fact, he was a close friend of mine, drove out there and such a tank there and they had a new rocket launcher mounted on top of the tank 
with, I think there was 12 rounds of rockets mounted on top of it. Uh -huh. Then they fired the first round, the second round ruptured and caught on fire. Oh my. And we hollered at them to get out of there. We was in an observation metal tower about 200 feet from that. I was up in the tower with the photographer. Then they hollered out and the, the civilian that was in there with him, he come out of the tank and jumped off the tank and about that time it all exploded. Killed my friend and blowed him flat out of the ground. But he lived for about a day. <coughs> and within, I'd say, 10 minutes, we had a life spot out there. That was the most tragedy that I experienced. Did they continue to test those same kinds of rockets the next day and thereafter? Uh, or did you find I out what was wrong with them? I don't, I don't remember them even doing any more with them. <coughs> I don't think, I never seen any more. Yeah. But I was about to, my experience there, of course, I've done a lot of things in the shop down there whenever it was needed. But I guess you'd say I really had a good life as far as being in the service. And That went on for I don't know how long the time now. Can't remember the days, but my superior officer got a notice from Washington that I was classified as 1A and hadn't had overseas service, so that I would have to be go back to Aberdeen and take a six weeks or so training. Uh -huh. and be shipped overseas. Huh. Well, he sent a letter to Washington and I was essentially in his shop and they canceled it. Well, that went on for about three more, four more months and I got the second notice regardless. You, if you haven't had overseas service, you'll have to go. Uh -huh. So, I was shipped back up to Aberdeen and I had a choice of two or three different schools that I could go into for training to go overseas. And I said, I want an automotive school. Okay. Which I'd asked for to start with. Uh -huh. So I got into the automotive school. And the only thing that first course in automotive school was how to use wrenches how to, and all about tools and stuff like that. So that was there for, we had to make a wrench. Take a piece of just scrap metal and make a wrench. Really? So I made a wrench and the lieutenant come around one afternoon and he says, you act like you know, know what you're doing. <laughs> and you did because you've been doing that all your life on the farm. Mm -hmm. So he said, how would you like to be an instructor? I said, I don't know, I've never done any teaching, I don't know anything about it. I said, I, I wasn't too good in school, so. so he took me in the office and asked me about 75 questions. And he turned around and he says, you've asked about, or answered about 65 of the questions that I've asked you. He says, do you know what the average one that I would have called in here and asked them the same question would have answered? I said, I don't have no idea. He said, maybe 35 to 40 percent. So you were 100 percent better than the average person? I don't know if it was 100, but I was a lot better according to him. He said, now, do you want to be a teacher or don't you? <laughs> I said, I'll try it. So I moved into a private room in the barracks that night and stayed there the rest of the time as a teacher in the First course of automotive school. At Aberdeen. At Aberdeen. Proving grounds. That goes to prove you that you don't have to go overseas if you get the right connections. Yeah. 
Well, it sounds like from your experience with rockets, there's just as much danger and hazard working with testing weapons as there is in a battlefront. Well, there's more. More? If, because when you test them, you don't have no idea what it's going to do. You have to put all them things together and run. Of course, they're always cautious that they're in places where it's not just among a bunch of people. They've got to have bomb shelters or some type of protection. Protection. But even in putting fuses in them and stuff is a risk unless you kind of sort of use caution. We had all that. I never did have to do but just a very little when I first went down there. Just so happened by luck, I got in with the fellow in charge and him and me got along real well. And it kept me there. Do you recall his name by any chance? Tom Trojanowski. Trojanowski. Where was he from? Up in New York State. He was right between the finger legs. Did you ever see him at all after the war? Yes. Oh, you did? I went, went deer hunting with him after the war. But he was Polish. Polak. A mighty good friend. Mighty good friend. Oh, that's great. And I suppose that he probably died about two years ago. I see. And your age today is what? My age is 90 years old, heading towards 91. <laughs> well, I'm sure you'll make it. <laughs> <laughs> what else happened during the course? You mentioned that you went back to Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Where were you when you were working on some of the equipment? Was that nearby or down? I was in Edgewood. Edgewood? One detached service. Edgewood, Maryland? Yeah. Edgewood Arsenal. Edgewood Arsenal. Edgewood Arsenal is a, is a chemical post which is separate, separate from Aberdeen Brewing Grounds. And it's about 13 miles apart. But Chesapeake Bay, see, goes up in between them in there. Yes. And That's around Hobbes de Gras. Havre Grace. Havre Grace is on the other side of Aberdeen from Havre Grace. Yeah. We just have to walk down the total Havre Grace. I wonder if Edgewood Arsenal is still in business today. I don't know. Uh, Aberdeen certainly is. That's a huge... We was up there, what, 12, 13 years ago? And I don't... I can't remember whether we found anything about the place or not. Everything has changed so that we didn't even know the place of it. Mm -hmm. In fact, we went through the museum up there at Aberdeen while we was up there. But all the barracks area where I was at is all gone. Of course, the proving grounds is in below that. That was all fenced off separate. Mm -hmm. But when I got my papers to be dismissed from the service or my discharge, I was asked if I would accept an offer to stay there and work on the proving grounds and still my time go towards retirement. As a civilian? Yep. Wonderful. And I said, no, I went home. Even she went to the doctor up there and the doctor told her to beg me to stay. <laughs> Well now, you knew Virginia, your current wife of uh, over 60 years, before you went in the Army, is that right? Yeah, I knew her before I went to service, but we didn't go together right I knew her. You knew her? Went with her a few times, off and on. But you made the trip home frequently in a Model A Ford or something like that? <laughs> 39 Ford. 39 Ford. Yeah, I made a few trips home. Well, I didn't make too many in the car, but I did. I used to catch the Baltimore, the train there in, in Aberdeen, and I could get a round trip ticket for $14 to Cincinnati and back. I could get off work up there at 
four o'clock in the afternoon, get on the train and be right here in Cincinnati the next morning. Wow. And then we're going out home to spend it too, come back, get on the train, go back. Now, would Virginia pick you up at this station or do you have to? Have no, I most usually just got a ride or took a ride. I even hitchhiked to Williamstown a few times and called my sister and she'd come pick me up. And most usually somebody would bring me back over here. In fact, my brother in Virginia brought me back over here to train one time. And she went back home with my brother and I began to worry about that. Did you travel in uniform then? Had to. Had to? Yeah. So if you wanted to hitchhike, it was pretty easy to get a ride because everybody... We used to hitchhike all over the country. There's no problem. No problem. Because anybody in uniform was obviously... If you was on the uniform then and stood out, most anybody come along and pick you up. A couple of us boys decided one day we didn't have nothing to do. What are we going to do? Let's go out and see how far we can go and get back to that. Well, now, uh, when you got home to uh, Williamstown, you went to see Virginia, of course. And what did you do? Did you go to the movie or anything <laughs> like that? I don't remember what we done. I don't remember going to the movie. Just visited. Just visited. Yeah. And that would not be for more than a day or two sometimes. I'd usually get a three-day pass once a month and get a weekend with it, which gave you five days. Now, what was she doing back home when you were in Aberdeen? Well, the first couple or so years, she was at home. And then she got into nurse's training at St. Elizabeth. And of course, her time was, she didn't have much time off. I come in one weekend and stopped over to see if she, she was at the hospital. And I went in there and they said, well, her and some of the girls had just went over on uh, one of the streets over there in Covington. And so I drove over there and here they was walking up the street. Was she in her uniform then? No. No. Didn't. But she had a uniform. Nurse's uniform. I don't think she wore the uniform out at all, did you? We were allowed out of the building in our white uniform. We had our gray cadet uniform on. We were, but uh, we rarely ever put the cadet uniform on unless it was so special. Well, she probably, uh, had the war continued on, she probably could have gone into the Army or the yes. Navy as a nurse after she completed her training. Well, see, after the war was over, I come home and asked her to marry me. Said she would. But Were you if surprised? She would, if she would have finished her training, she would have had to went overseas. Ah. So, So she gave up her training, and then she moved back on the, up there in the housing, in the government housing project off the post until I got out of the service. Oh, I see. Do you remember what year that was? That was about 44, 45? 45. 1945. We lived up there for, what was it, four months until I got out. Four months. Maybe five months, I don't know. Uh, Where were you married? We was married at, uh, just almost next door to them up there in the country at, their, at a preacher that lived right up there by them. He was, I think he married the whole family. <laughs> and then you, you got in the car then and your honeymoon was to drive back to Aberdeen and your 1939 I had, I had the week off. I got home on, a, I think it was on a Saturday. And I went to see her on Monday morning. I went over and picked her up. We drove to Maysville and got our blood test and everything approval for her grace and went to the courthouse and got her license. Went to the preacher and got married. Come back home and introduced her to my family. And we took off to go to Lexington to spend the night. 
we got to Lexington and there was a, a horse, big popular horse race or something on there going on and there wasn't a motel room in Lexington. Oh my. We had to drive to Rich, Richmond to get a hotel room. In your 1939 Ford? Yeah. Was that a convertible? No, no, no. Two doors? That was a coupe. Coupe. What did gas cost in those days? Anywhere from 18 to 22 cents. 18 to 22 cents? Yeah. Do you remember what you were paid as a uh, <clears throat> specialist in the Army? I think I started out with 61 or 62 dollars a month, wow. if I remember. That's kind of hard to remember, but it was right around that. And then uh, after I got some rating, it went up. Uh -huh. I got PFC there to start with, and then I got T5, and I was put in for tech sergeant. And they said there was no more ratings opening, so I couldn't get it. Earl, you brought some wonderful photos with you. We'd like to incorporate these in the uh, interview. And uh, why don't you talk to us about this photo? If uh, we can get a picture of that, we'll include that on a, the interview for you on the DVD. Why don't you use that to tell us who's in that's there? That's one of the work crews that I drove the tank or the bomb shelter out in the field where they done the run the tests on. And I would drive it out there, and of course this is two of the commissioned officers, and three boys went out to do the tests and the results and everything, and I went back to the to the shop, back to the garage. Now that would be at Edgewood Arsenal? Yes. Thank you. This would be detached service over, it was in the proving grounds, but we would stay at Edgewood Arsenal. Okay. You remember any of those fellows in there? I can't remember their names. I remember their faces and stuff like that, but I, I can't remember their names. But you worked with them on a daily basis? Yeah, anytime there was tests run and there was their, one of their tests, I would take them out. I can tell you one story about this one lieutenant. Please do. <laughs> He decided one Sunday that he was going to go out and get the amphibian truck and go out into the bay. Now, I don't know why, but he was going to go out in the bay, whether it was duck hunting or fishing or just because he wanted to go. Now, that amphibian truck was one of those ducks? Yep. Was a duck that yep. goes, you just... GMC, what they call a duck. They have a propeller on the back? Yep. So. Okay. Underneath. Anyway, he went out there and he got in and he took off and he got about 50 to 75 feet out of the Chesapeake Bay and all of a sudden he seen water coming in. Was he alone? Yeah. So he managed to turn it around and get out of there. The only drain float had been left out of. And he come back on the Monday morning and boy, he come and jumped all over me. You left the drain plugs out of that thing and almost sank out there. I said, sir, I had orders to leave them out. No, you're not supposed to do anything like that. Well, he really threw the fit. He was going to ship me up. Well, it went back and got in the major's hands and he almost got shipped out. Really? He says, you did not have no authority to use it. He has orders to leave them loads out. So it drains. Anytime you come in, you leave them out. And if you use it, you put them in. That could have sunk in a matter of minutes. Yeah. yeah. And it's very heavy in it. That's right. So he was very fortunate to be able to get it back to land before it. Yeah, he was. Sunk. He just happens to see there's water coming into it and they realize well, there's something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but he wanted to blame it all on me. And I'd only done what I had orders to do. Sure. 
Any time it was used, comes in, you drain the plug. You take the plugs and drain them. So he never borrowed it again? Well, if he did, I never didn't know it. <laughs> it didn't come back to me. Do you ever drive that out to the bay personally yourself? Yeah. You did. How did it handle? Was Good. It? I know some, fact, some cities around America paint them white and they use it for... One time they was uh, firing some rockets all the way across this uh, part of the Chesapeake Bay there and they were going to go over on the other side and set up cameras over there. So I had to take a bunch of men over there in this amphibian tank. Well, went over there and they run the test. And I stayed over there that time. And got in the tank to bring them back and it was getting almost night. And I run into a bomb where the a bomb had dropped into the bay mm -hmm. and water is only about two feet deep. Oh my. And this thing with the wheels is all in that pit in there and it wasn't enough to float it to float it out and the wheels wouldn't pull it out. So I was stuck. So we had to radio in that we were stuck in Chesapeake Bay and we had to sit there for two hours waiting for them to come over there with one of these little weasels because they will go in eight or ten inches of water. Hmm. Muck or whatever. So they come over there and got us and they had to run a cable from over in the approving grounds clear out there and reach that thing out. That's a long cable. Yeah. Very long cable. And of course I didn't have nothing to do with that. They just brought in, but they brought us in and we went to the mess hall that night to get our supper because it was already about nine o'clock. And what they had was oyster stew left mm -hmm. over. And I got <laughs> all the oyster stew I wanted. <laughs> so that worked out real well for you. Yep. Oh, that's great. And one time they was firing some rockets in there and there was two or three trees in between the area where there was a farm and where they wanted them to land. It was cutting their vision or something. So they called down there and wanted to know if I'd bring that big heavy tank out there and knock them trees down. I went out there and knocked all the trees down. Clear the view for them. <laughs> Here's another photo, Earl, of you in an MP armband with a sidearm on your right side. Now that's that's when and I maybe you can tell us about that. That's when I was in the MPs there at Aberdeen. That was probably when we was going on town on town patrol. You had to wear that band on. Or if you was doing traffic, we had to wear that. Uh, did you have to make any arrests of uh, fellow servicemen? In all the time that I've done town patrol, I don't ever remember but having to take in two soldiers that was drunk. And we just got them in the patio wagon and took them back to their barracks. And that was the end of that? That was the end of that. We, so, we got a call one night to a boy who tried to make a phone call and he couldn't get it through and he got kind of mad and he broke the phone booth down. <laughs> <laughs> By the time we got there, he was gone. And we'd get called once in a while to, to a, I guess you'd say a beer joint or a joint. We had to visit them ever so often. Uh, we'd get a call once in a while that there's some boys causing some problems there. By the time we get there, they'd already calmed down. Because whenever we step in the door, everything's quiet. <laughs> Now, would you go into town for eight hours at a time, or uh, in the evening? We were on there? town patrol from dusk till twelve o'clock. Then you'd go back to the barracks. And then we'd go back to the barracks. Of course, most of the towns that we walked town patrol in had a off limits for soldiers. 
Oh. At 11 o'clock. Oh. Of course, after, we had to stay then to make sure there was no soldiers on the streets. Did you ever have to draw your sidearm? No. Never? Never. No. But you would have if you had to. Well, I don't know. I never did experience that. <laughs> what uh, was that, 45? Uh, yeah, 45. Mm -hmm. I used to know the name of it. Uh, we always had ammunition. Mm -hmm. Of course, now when we walk, or when we had guard duty, on the post with some of the boys that was in, I guess you'd say, in, we call it a prison, but it was, they was in there for maybe doing something mischief or something. We used to have a work crew that we had to take out to pick up trash or pick up stuff over the camp, over the grounds, then we'd take a truck and maybe three to four boys, and we'd carry a sawed-off shotgun. Oh. And all I'd do is just sit on the truck and say the girls out there with them, and drive them to park and let them walk and pick up stuff. Never did have no trouble with them. In fact, there was a time or two I even had them the gun until I'd get up the truck. Here's another photo of Earl. We'll try to put that in the uh, interview. Could you explain the uh, insignia on your Left arm, your shoulder, and also the, it looks like a well, decoration for it. It's insignia, but it's got T5, and then I got some medals on there. Now, what's T5? Now, this is what they call a T5, it's a technician fifth grade. Fifth grade. I don't know why they get fifth grade, but <laughs> that's, they only have one higher than that. T6, I guess. Well, it's a sergeant technician. This is a corporal technician. Corporal technician, yeah. okay. And what is the uh, award on your chest there? That looks like a, a riflery or? Uh, I got marksmanship in two or three different types of guns. What, uh, what guns were those? Well, I got marksmanship in an M1, and then I got uh, rifle marksmanship with a Carbine. And it seemed to me like I got one on a, on a pistol too, but I, I can't remember too well about it. We only had that when we was in the MPs up there. And I got two or three different good conduct medal, and another one is, I can't even remember what the other one was. They're all on that discharge paper, what they are. I got them on my uniform at home yet. Yeah. Still? Yeah. Still have your uniform? Yeah. That's why I can't wear it, but I've got it. <laughs> it's a little bit tight around my chest. <laughs> but you still have your uniform? Yeah. I still have the coat. I don't have the pants. That's great. What was it like when you finally got home after being up there and you were newly married and everybody was pretty happy to have the war over? What, when did you get home? Was that late 45, 1945? Uh, no, I got home 46. in January of 46. 46, okay. And I got home, we got home on a Saturday I went to Cincinnati on Monday. I'd already made up my mind that I was going to try and get into body work in Cincinnati. So I got orders that I could get help from the government on getting the job in it. Uh -huh. So I come to Cincinnati and went in with Lou Bars there and talked to him about getting in there as a body man. I said I could get help from the service on a certain amount of the pay. So he looked it up and he, for a little while, and he says, yeah, we can do that. So he paid, they, the government paid part of my salary for a while. 
course, back then, where we lived, there was nobody much else to do things with me. Some older, older people. That's why I got to ride a bicycle and go out and a bunch of us boys get together and ride bicycles. Uh -huh. No matter where we'd go. That was your main method of transportation. Yeah. Well, I even got a car when I was 16 years old and couldn't afford gas for it, so <laughs> ride a bicycle. Did you need a license to drive a car in those days? Not when I first got one. I got one when I was 16 years old. And I can't remember the dates that I had to get a license. Didn't have to have insurance in either. It was more than too many years till all that stuff changed. What happened to your 1939 Ford? <laughs> I don't know whether I ought to tell that or not. <laughs> Probably traded it for something else. Cars were pretty scarce though during the war, yes. weren't they? I bought that 39 Ford. It was a year old from a drummer. From a who? Drummer. A drummer? Yeah, he was a salesperson. They only drive a car once a year. They drive it one year and trade it in. So I bought that 39 Ford. I had an old Dodge that wasn't even hardly runnable. It was run, but you couldn't hardly keep it running on account you couldn't keep oil in it. Hmm. I traded it in for 300 and got that Ford for $300 in that old car. And I run it from 41. It was early 41 until I got out of the service and kept it up in pretty good shape. Got out of the service and we come to Covington looking for different apartments and different things like that to get started and I pulled up in front of the, the right over in Covington by the Covington chili parlor mm -hmm. and some guy walks across the street and said, would you like to sell that car? I said, no, I haven't thought much about it. He said, what do you take for it? I said, $600. <laughs> walked on around, we eat our dinner, come back, he was sitting on the fender with $600 in his hand. <laughs> I said, well, I said, I'm not going to back out on my word, but I said, I really hadn't thought nothing about him selling. I said, since I said I'll take it to you now, I said, but you'll have to follow me to close to Falmouth and take my stuff out of it. He said, that's all right, we'll follow you. Good. Well, I let him have it. Earl, one of the uh, questions we like to ask people in these interviews is, uh, what did you think about uh, dropping the bomb on Japan? Was that a... I didn't know nothing about it until it happened. Was say stuff like that's always kept quiet. Sure. Was that, in retrospect, a good idea, or was it controversial, or that was Harry Truman, President Harry Truman at the time? Does that make that Well, decision? I think it was really awful that they had to do it. Uh -huh. But there had to be something there to clear up and change the situation. Uh -huh. Because it's hard to tell what really would have took place if we hadn't. There'd been a lot more of our boys killed. And, well, it's hard to tell. We might have been, we might have been a Japanese today. That's right. So you can't predict them things. I mean, I hated that we had to do something that drastic. Well, if there's uh, anything else you'd like to add, please do. Well, I don't know. I think we pretty well covered it from start to finish. You did a great job. And uh, in order to conclude this, I'd simply like to say that uh, on behalf of all the uh, Americans that have <coughs> served in your capacity, men and women, we'd like to thank you for your loyal and honorable service during a period of great need in America. And 
thus far. This concludes the interview. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, I could say after that that I joined the reserve. Sure. That's how come I got three discharges. Okay. Why don't you mention those? <laughs> well, when I went to get my discharge, they asked me if I would uh, volunteer to be in the reserves for three years. And they told me why it was necessary and the reason. And I said, well, it'll be fine, I'll do that. So I couldn't get my permanent uh, discharge. Or so they gave me a temporary discharge. And then when that time, three years up, I got my permanent discharge and then I got a no one there and I don't remember what was the reason for it. But he ended up with three discharges. One of the other documents I think we might be able to include uh, is this amended GI Bill of Rights and how it works. An explanation of the provisions, questions and answers and completed amended text. And uh, that's dated December 28, 1945. So that's it. That's the day I got out. That's the day that I was, got the discharge from the service at Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. And that's a valuable document. And this finally is a uh, letter from the War Department, the Adjutant General's Office, Washington 25, D.C. And the subject is appreciation. And it says, it is desired to express to you the appreciation of the War Department for your continued service to national defense through enlistment in the Enlisted Reserve Corps. Your aid and that of other veterans who, like you, are displaying an act of interest by enlisting in the Reserve will be invaluable in building and maintaining a sound and effective post-war Army. Paragraph 2 says that Army Regulation 150-5 and the other Army Regulations governing the Enlisted Reserve Corps will be revised to conform with such statutes as may be enacted to govern the post-war Army. Revised regulations and other information concerning the Enlisted Reserve Corps will be made available in the future. By order of the Secretary of War, Edward F. Witzel, Major General, acting the Adjutant General. See, I didn't get all my final papers until after I got it, the reserves was over. I got the ones from Indiantown to get, and that's all. Well, we'll try to incorporate these into the uh, DVD. And again, thank you for your loyal and patriotic service to the United States Army.